What's going on, everyone, and welcome to Numbers Therapy. So a bit of background. We created Numbers Therapy originally to talk through the macro and bring on and showcase our experts in Metaverse HQ, and more specifically, so everyone can understand how all the big pieces fit together to make better decisions with NFTs and other investments using a balanced perspective, to learn about or from some of our people in the community, and to learn about different areas and opportunities out there, including different ways of thinking. More on Metaverse HQ, which we call MVHQ. MVHQ is the top Web3 trading and networking community, and we showcase traders, analysts, builders, and a variety of other rising experts in the space. All right, all right, Jim, everybody, and welcome to Numbers Therapy, episode 45. Today's episode titled The Pudgy Penguin Renaissance. The purpose of numbers therapy, as we all know, to talk through the macro, operational, financial, technical, trading-based, other dimensions of Web3, the pieces together to help everyone understand the latest picture, continue to elevate while hearing some incredible backstories and having some good laughs along the way. For anybody who's live, uh, you can, of course, ask questions. If it's an intro question, there are probably other people with the same question about definitions or acronyms. Advanced, feel free to ask that as well. We'll be sure to weave it in along the way. And lastly, Numbers Therapy is rated NFA as in none of what you hear in here is financial advice. So without further ado, and on to today's guest and episode. Today's guest has a really unique background coming from well beyond Web3 and tech. His journey is an incredible showcase of what grit, hustle, perseverance can do, and even more so ensuring there are lessons along the way. He's seen a lot and touched a variety of businesses across consumer products and tech, ranging from new businesses existing, evolved businesses. Emergence in the space was one of the most hotly discussed deals, uh, representing an unprecedented acquisition of a once classic and then fledgling brand into a new world and the related implications, many positive uh, on the community and greater Web3 community. Very happy to have this guy's new friend and colleague. Please, everyone, welcome Luca Nets to the stage, everyone. Luca, how are you doing today? I am doing great. How about you? Doing extremely, extremely well. And I just want to make sure we dispel one thing before we start the, the, the real conversation. So first off, are you a basketball fan uh, or do you play basketball or either of them? Uh, I am a huge basketball fan and I play basketball. OK, so both of them. Um, so, it, you know, it's not lost on us like Luca, Luca Nets, Luca, Luca Doncic, Nets like basketball. We're just confirming you're not Luca Doncic, though, right? We're, we're, we're confirmed on that. I'm not Luka Doncic. We are confirmed. Okay, okay. It, is, it is confirmed at this point, and we're ready to get moving. Um, so let's start with uh, your background in, in history, if you can. So if you can maybe give some framing background to, to anybody who maybe has not heard from me before. You know, pre-NFT world, pre-Web3, you know, kind of what was, your, what was your background? Maybe, you know, even from the start, because I know you have a really interesting background. Yeah, I'll give you the short version. Uh, I grew up homeless with my mom and my brother. Not homeless like we didn't. We were sleeping under a bridge. We were fortunate enough, but we just didn't have a home. We were staying uh, guest bedroom to guest bedroom, whoever would take us in at the time. Uh, and then we moved to Los Angeles. I went to Fairfax High School at 16. I had to leave school because my mom was still struggling to pay the bills and I needed to help her. And so... I got my first job at a tech startup called Ring. I was one of their early employees. I watched that company basically go from nothing to billion dollar business. At 18, I started my first direct to consumer brand selling jewelry online. At 19, I sold that for quite a bit of money. I then was monetizing social influence, being young and successful in Los Angeles. I realized that influencers had millions of followers, but they did not have millions of dollars. And so I decided to build direct-to-consumer brands and merchandise around their likeness. We did just north of a quarter of a billion dollars in sales in three and a half years. I then went to become the CMO of a company called Von Dutch. And so I brought that back in 2020. It was kind of a hot brand in the early 2000s. It died and kind of when Chrome Hearts was coming back, I was like, oh, Von Dutch is definitely the next up. I tried to get Ed Hardy, and then they wouldn't do a deal. And then I went to co-found and become the CMO of North America's fastest growing toy company, which is a toy gun called Gel Blaster. Gel Blaster is a uh, gun toy gun that shoots little water orbies. So it's a 
better than Nerf, kind of a Nerf killer. I was on a road trip with the Nelk boys at the time, and this assistant named Courtney brings out these little guns and turns out to be a Kickstarter product. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I got to have a piece of this. And we work out a deal and take that thing to the moon. So uh, all the while I was trading NFTs, I actually had a moment where I arbitraged some Instagram posts. It was like a really crazy time. I was a huge collector. My first PFP that I ever purchased was a pudgy penguin. Before that, I was more in the fine art. I believed in pudgy penguins the day that I saw it as a consumer. And I thought it had all of the ingredients to succeed. Unfortunately, it did not work out well uh, for the pudgy penguins at the time. The founders just didn't know what they were doing. Uh, to kind of push the brand and the company forward. No fault to them. This business is very difficult. And uh, coincidentally, in December, I just wake up one morning after kind of going on this like spiritual retreat to kind of see, you know, something in Gel Blaster wasn't fulfilling. I don't know what, but I kind of felt like maybe there might be another thing ahead. Direct to consumer, I felt like I just mastered consumer products and direct to consumer. I wanted to do something that I thought was more challenging. <laughs> And then by the grace of God, I'm scrolling and I just see people bidding on these pudgy penguins and obviously seeing what Bored Ape did. I was aware of their their raise before they kind of announced it. And I was just like, dude, everyone's saying that they're building a brand, but none of them are actually doing it right. Like like everyone was just using a lot of, you know, hot words and keywords to kind of get people excited about their NFT. And then when you kind of pulled back the layers, you realize that nobody was doing anything and everyone had 10, 15, 20, 50, a hundred, $200 million. And at, at a certain point I was actually getting really frustrated. And so, you know, just, you know, information, I have millions of dollars in NFTs. And I was just like, dude, you guys have all the opportunity in the world. This makes so much sense. This is unequivocally the future of collecting but like I felt like nobody was delivering except for Yuga but then I even felt like well Yuga's made so much money that like there's no reason why they're not doing some of the obvious like just standard growth and you know, character building which they, they've now have kind of turned that corner and I think they're being very productive and so rather than just complaining and just saying, oh, like this sucks. I was, I was, I'm blessed to be in a position where I can do something about it. And I felt like Pudgy Penguins was one of maybe five projects that has the right ingredients to be what I believe is the face of NFTs and the number one project in the space. And so I took it over about 13 months ago. Unfortunately, we got dealt uh, a lot of rough hands up until this point with just macro and all of the things that come with that and royalties and the whole nine, but it's neither here nor there. Um, it's been a blessing in disguise and I'm super fortunate to be where we are today. Uh, we recently announced our seed round. Uh, and so we're fortunate to be in that position as well. And our vision is really, how do we build web three's first great IP company? And how do we do something in the NFT space that I believe is yet to be done. And I honestly believe is the biggest open ocean with the biggest upside which is really building the IP and the character. Uh, to me, the pudgy penguin is an influencer. Back to my influencer monetization days. And uh, I plan on building the biggest, baddest celebrity and influencer with this pudgy penguin and um, plan on uh, translating that value and that success back to our holders and our community. And so that is the uh, brief TLDR. You'd be surprised it gets a lot longer and detailed than that. But I don't want to bore you guys with the details and happy to be on this conversation today. I don't, I don't think uh, you're boring anybody with the context. I mean, it's a super, super interesting background. Funny side comment, by the way, which is uh, I was in the location where Ring was located and to, to the person that actually is in that space right now. And the comment he made was as the Ring folks were leaving, something along the lines of make sure to keep the karma, karma and the juju up at this location and, you know, make sure you're exiting and that kind of a thing. So funny, random comment <laughs> coming across your path. Um of course, when you say there were, you know, not just pudgies, but that five projects that you thought could meet the criteria that would exist, you know, we're going to ask the question, what were the other four projects that would meet the parameter? <laughs> or more importantly than that, maybe what I think might be more interesting is what's your framework for it? Like, what were the parameters that said it, it could be one of those five projects as well as what were those four other projects? 
That's a great question. Now, I had no intention to go buy an NFT project. I actually tried to buy my friend's NFT project about four months earlier. Uh, I just fell in love with that community. I was like, this dude was such a clown, but he he was a really good friend of mine at the time, but really showed his true colors. And I tried to purchase it off of him, but he didn't want to do it. Uh, but I fell in love with that community. I got super attached. And then I, I had no intention of buying anything, though it, it just kind of came. And then when I was assessing, okay, buying Pudgy Penguins, I was like, okay, well, is there a better project for a better price? The answer I ultimately came to was no. But, I mean, the ingredients that you really want to look for, I think, first and foremost, crypto crypto appreciates historical significance and provenance. I think, like, crypto punks are a testament to that. And to say that Pudgy Penguins is not historically significant is to not be around. It, you just haven't been around in NFTs long enough if you don't believe that. And so, like, I was really like, dude, I have a six monitor fucking war station. And I was like, I, I've just been I like this was I had got the real NFT bug in the summer of 2021. And this space didn't really hit its parabolic curve until Pudgy Penguins had its insane run. Like it's Pudgy Penguins parabolic run in summer of 2021. If you were there and you saw it, you know what that did for the space. New York Times printed it in the actual print of the New York Times, which is like only NFT project to ever do that. CNBC, it wasn't Bored Apes, it wasn't CryptoPunks, it was Pudgy Penguins, Pudgy Penguins, left and right, all over the, the, the world. And for two weeks, it was the epicenter. And then before that, liquidity just started translating to everything else. And then the real degeneracy kind of started happening. And that's important in crypto and NFTs. Like that type of base and foundation you can't really buy. And with that early run came a buy-in from affluent, affluent figures in the space that, you know, some, some guy can go raise $100 million from venture right now and, like, you can't curate that type of community. You either have it or you don't. And so, like, the people like GCR and Jeebus and Elmo and, you know, Kaleo and, like, all these guys, you know, Pentoshi, just, like you either have these people in your community or you don't. Right. And like, you can't buy them. There's nothing you can do to like message them or convince them. Like if anything, you try to sh pitch them, it's not going to work. And this type of like OG really native crypto core has shown time and time again, that in this space, if you have it, you will ultimately win. I also felt like the community was so great and like it was built off of this culture of memes and like good vibes and they were really personifying it in its greatest form. And I think the next one is they were really battle tested. I mean, there is nothing that can happen to the pudgy penguins that can ruin it at this point. Like the FUD that they had, like I would have to be a serial killer or like I would have to like it have to be some seriously like deep, deep, messed up shit, which, like, as far as I'm concerned, is not relevant in the Pudgy Penguin team. But it's transcended any one person, which I think is really important, or any one thing. Like, Pudgy Penguins got the worst FUD of them all, and the lowest floor it ever hit was a 0.5 ETH floor, which for most is a huge accomplishment. Like, for most, 0.5 ETH floor, a lot of people will be jumping for joy if they hit a 0.5 ETH floor. Yeah. And, like, to say that, like, that was its lowest is pretty cool. And so, the, you know, you are made stronger through the FUD. For anybody who's with a community that's going through the FUD, you need to embrace the FUD because the FUD definitely makes you stronger. And so when you, when you put this, or, you know, this historical significance and provenance plus this affluent user base plus A1 community and culture plus – Amazing IP. Like if you look at Pudgy Penguins and you look, you know, Pudgy Penguins, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Pepe the Pig, like you can like it flows right in line with anything that's worked traditionally. Right. And so like the character, when you look at penguins, people love penguins. People love the penguin character. But who's really owned 
the penguin character from a brand perspective. I believe we have the best looking penguin ever made, which is not to be underestimated because people love penguins the same way they love dogs, cats, and lions. And from an aesthetic standpoint, I think we have the cutest penguin. They've always made penguins ugly. And so when I'm just like putting all these pieces together, I'm like, holy shit. It's not if, it's when. Penguins are inevitable, and all they need is a steward or a shepherd just accelerating the inevitable, right? And that's that's really what I felt I was. Whoever let me buy that thing for as cheap as two and a half million honestly should really question themselves because it really just took 30 to 40 minutes of like critical thinking to came to the same conclusion that I came to. And um here we are. That that was kind of the ingredients that I was looking for when kind of assessing the situation. Uh, OK, what, what were other some other projects that would kind of fit the same ingredients? Um, I think Gutter Cat Gang before they before the supply just got too big with all the new mints. So this was like before Mint Oblivion. I think Gutter Cat Gang from a culture perspective had that. Um, I was. Um, Lazy Lions was pretty interesting, but though I like could saw some interesting discrepancies with that. I actually really liked OK Bears, but then, then I was like, uh, no, and then I, and I think they're doing their thing. Um, OK Bears, because it was it was really it really kicked off soul NFTs in a big way. And so it's historically significant in that respect. Lazy Lions, you know, all of them are missing one of the key ingredients, right? All of them have like three or four out of the five key ingredients, but none of them had them all. And and this one to me just had them all. And so I was just thinking to myself, well, you know, this is a, a once in a lifetime opportunity. I believe that this is the future. I really believe that with every part of my body and and, and everything that every, every iota of brain cell in my consciousness and so, you know, what better opportunity than with these cute little pudgy penguins? It 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 leaned in right into my skill set, like what I believe I'm good at, which is like marketing and awareness and product, I think fell right in line with you know where I want to take this. And you know, what I'm really good at, I believe ultimately the space needs to lead into. And right now nobody's doing where where we want to go. And though they might like try to copy. They don't nat. They haven't naturally succeeded time and time again going after this vertical, which is just like product takeover, invade the hearts and minds of millions of people across the country and around the world. Like this, I say it like this is my three for three. I've done this twice before. Von Dutch was interesting because when I took over Von Dutch, they were doing twenty grand a month. Online. By the time I left, they were doing ten million dollars a month. It was a complete eighteen month turnaround. Uh, Gel Blaster, you know, does one hundred and fifty million dollars a year in revenue. When I came into that, it was a Kickstarter product, right? And so, like, I, you know, granted, you know, Von Dutch is an interesting one because, you know, I, I really, really, my experience with Von Dutch made me really comfortable to do the penguins. Actually, I think a theme for me, you know, is is taking over things. I actually kind of like it because honestly, the hard part with pudgy penguins and the hard part with Von Dutch was already done, which was finding that immediate product market fit. That is the really, really hard part that most people fail. And I'm blessed enough to be in a position where I can kind of like buy my way into that. And, And in this situation, I was like, I love the NFT space. I saw the Gary V thing. I never wanted to own a project because I knew the responsibility, right? I've been a part of, you know, I've had friends that have done a lot of things and I've kind of helped them and, and plugged here and there and kind of got in the weeds of what it is to run an NFT business. But I never was like, hey, this is my project. I'm going to do this. And I just saw the writing on the wall and I was and everything lined up perfectly for me to kind of make this decision, and make this purchase. And I'm glad I did. Yeah, yeah, that makes total sense. It's great, great context. I was thinking the same thing that you said, very, very, very parallel to Von Dutch, right? I mean, you're taking like a distressed asset, basically, with good brand equity and theory and a good good history and everything, and reshaping it, right, for, for, exactly. for the current context. I mean, really, really parallel. So at the time, you got this idea, you saw people were bidding online, or at least proposing it. So how did that all go down at that point? Like, how did how did this, to the extent you feel comfortable sharing, how did this deal actually go down? Like, I know we heard like examples of Twitter spaces and that whole thing. What's actually happening in the background? How did the deal actually, like whatever you feel comfortable sharing there? 
So this is really funny. I, I'm not going to dive too deep into this side of the story. I'm going to do it like once we really win and we're at like a 50 or 100 ETH floor, like I'll do like a whole three hour monologue on like how crazy this story really is. First and foremost, I went to Sedona, Arizona to basically go on the spiritual retreat. I never do this. I've never been on a spiritual retreat. I'm just like, dude, Sedona is like this vortex, like very like interesting place on the planet. And as I'm driving out of this one week retreat, I spent seven days there. And like my number one thought is like, what's next? Because Gel Blaster went from like a really fun business to like, hey, you got to do like NASCAR sponsorships because I'm CMO. Right. And like it went from viral growth marketing and Internet takeover to like, hey, Walmart is doing 80 percent of your revenue. Make Walmart happy. So I was slowly getting resentful. I was like, dude, I'm not here to like get on calls with Walmart and like do what they want me to do. Like, I get it. Like, obviously, that's what the business needs, but I'm not the best person for that. I have my equity. Like, I'm actually doing the business a disservice. Like, I did what I needed to do, which is make this product the hottest toy in America. And we did that. And so I'm leaving Sedona. Literally, as I see the Sedona sign, like, as we're driving out, I'm texting my friends. I see this bid, and I just, like... I honestly didn't even want to do it, but like my fingers took over. It was almost like a mind numbing, like brainless tweet where I basically made the bid for 750 ETH. I didn't even really digest it. And the two weeks before that, so I'm an introvert. People don't know this, but I don't leave the house. I sit on my computer and I just work all day. I enjoy my life better that way. But two weeks before that, I went on a boat and I never go on a boat. And there was only eight people on this boat. And one person on that boat was a guy named Le Levi, random guy, never knew this guy. He ended up going to school, high school with Cole Ethereum, the guy who owned Pudgy Penguins. What a fucking coincidence, right? So I see this guy on the boat. A week later, I go to Sedona. As I leave Sedona, I make this brainless bid. Cole doesn't take it seriously. And then Levi calls me like three days later. He's like, yo, you know, it's Levi from the boat. I'm like, oh, hey, dude, how you doing? He's like, are you serious about that bid? I'm like, yeah. He's like, I went to school with Cole. Like, I'll tell him, whatever. He connects me with Cole. Cole's like, dude, I didn't know you were serious. Like, I was totally planning on ignoring you. Um, but Levi called, and I trust Levi. And I'm like, all right, dope. So we do the thing, and then we're negotiating, whatever. And he wanted me to – he wanted me the to – the sense that you got – by the way, sorry, just real fast. Was the sense that you got there that, like – the way that they that the kind of the tonality of the question back that you got like we just want out therefore we're like we're taking this seriously it was that kind of the feel that you got at that point yeah i mean the community wanted them out it's not that they they actually wanted to stay but the community is like dude we're done like get the heck out of here it was the community who really forced him out the, the he would if in his perfect world he would have stayed if it didn't get as bad as it did he i trust me he would have stayed I think the community was just like, dude, that's it, called the great riot of um, of uh, of December of 2022. It's like a, a known thing in the pudgy penguin lore. But we had this thing where it's exclamation point riot. And so when you don't like something, you riot. And they just rioted their ass out. Thousands of messages on the Discord. Riot, 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 riot. And like, <laughs> it's honestly, you've never seen you've never seen anything like it, truthfully. And. They, yeah, and we're negotiating, and I thought the deal wasn't going to go through because for a whole six weeks, the deal took like four months to close. It was like pretty difficult, but they were we were stuck on a clause where he wanted me to accept all the liability. And I was like, dude, why would I buy buy something for two and a half million dollars from you to incur all of your liability? Meaning, like, I don't know what, like, obviously, I don't know what you're not showing me through due diligence. Like, I don't know, like. Basically, if somebody were to sue him yeah, for yeah. pudgy penguins, I would get sued. I'm like, dude, I will never buy. You're basically saying I'm paying you two and a half million to get sued. Like, I'm not doing that. And then we ended up folding the day of when he signed the agreement. I signed it. I didn't, I didn't even prepare the money. I didn't even know really what was like. And I just sent it to him. And I was like, all right, well, looks like I'm finding a replacement at Joe Blaster and we're getting this thing going. That's that's incredible. Um, so, by the way, for context for you here, I'm not sure how familiar you are with MVHQ, but MVHQ definitely you ha definitely have some fans in here. Of course, of course, of your project, you got a couple of people sporting PFP right now in the background. One of the perks that exists within MVHQ is we have numbers therapy live, as you figured out. 
Um, and so we get some questions along the way. So we have an audience member with a question right now, and I'll, I'll kind of just build on their question. Asking is, you know, your point of view on the secondary collections of Pudgies, but I almost take it from the vantage point of when you entered also, right? So you came in and you had the core PFPs, and then you had these other, you know, little Pudgies and rods were shared, as well as the, you know, historical, uh, you know, flaws or gaffes that it, had, had existed. So how, how does that fit into your plan how did you manage that when you started kind of what was your frame with all those other elements so this has been the hardest part about one of the hardest parts about this and so floor price doesn't matter is bad advice i don't like that advice floor price matters a lot to me it's probably the most important thing to me because i want my holders to be happy and i want people to make money dude at the end of the day like i know what it is i think my best experience up until this point has been the fact that I spent millions of dollars on NFTs and I know exactly what the end consumer wants because I was that end consumer and I want my bags to go up. Right. And like, I, I know exactly like what, what that goes into and, and the little pudgies and the rods are super important if, from my perspective on like, how do we get those floor prices up? Cause I think that will bring the entire shift. It's like almost like a bottom up approach. Um, and so those are really important and, and not to be neglected though. When you look at the core factors of those collections, it, it, it is difficult. And it's difficult for a couple reasons. First one, the rods are just naturally difficult for obvious reasons. I don't think I need to explain that. It's 7,000 fishing rods, right? So I think everyone can understand how that could be difficult. Um, the second one is usually when you do secondary collections, there's like... There's a core differentiator and it feels like the best way to do a secondary collection in an NFT is not is to make it so that it attracts and appeals to a different audience. So like D gods and Utes, Utes attracts a different demographic, Azuki and Beans, Beans attract a different demographic. You could argue probably mutants the same, right? It's like a different type of a little bit different, probably not. That's probably the exception of the rule, but Little pudgies are interesting because a lot of people cop out of buying a big pudgy just to buy a little pudgy. And like that's because it's almost like one in the same. It's like, hey, we're, we're all penguins here, which is like a different mechanic because I almost need to drive a ton of demand to a 22,000 piece collection. And then it will trickle up to the to the big pudgy, the actual mechanics. And because there's a lot of like like. There's a way that you can orchestrate success in an NFT project. If you if you really stare at it for 12 months like I've been doing and you like really rip apart all of the layers, there's actually ingredients that make an NFT project successful and that get floor price high. Like there's actually math and it's something plus something plus something plus something plus something equals volume equals floor price equals collectors equals the whole you know like like it's actually not like just luck like there's actually a, a game plan to doing this and and part of that is just like appealing to different audiences and bringing different groups into your ecosystem and so how i look at the collections i love them and we've integrated them in a really interesting way i think they're naturally because of how their position has been a little tough, you know, quantity, size, positioning, things like that. But ultimately, like the direction that we're going, I think, you know, we have a we have a pretty rigorous plan over the next six months to kind of bring value to those two, because I am conscious you're only as strong as your weakest link. And I have three collections and the collection with the lowest floor price is my weakest link. And I have to optimize for the weakest link. Like you just have to. And then if they all rise, then they all start to rise with it and, and things start to become really awesome and cool. So uh, it, it's definitely a precarious situation and one that, you know, in an ideal world, like, like if we hit, you know, if, if none of these other collections existed, when we went to eight ETH, you know, back, you know, a couple months ago, I would have been quick to airdrop everybody something, right? But like, I can't because I have three collections. Like, I can't just go airdropping collections because then I'm diluting the digital supply and then things get bad, right? But airdropping collections are a great way to give value to their holders for free. Like, oh, whoa, I'm holding this core asset. He's giving me free NFTs. So a lot of like the really great mechanics that like a lot of projects have done to kind of break through that barrier, I'm handicapped by because like I already have these existing collections and there's only so much I can do. And if I'm a fool and I don't understand the math, 
then I will just ruin the whole thing, right? Because it's very mathematical when you talk about supply and demand and like how much supply you have and how much demand you have. And I'm at a point where if pudgy, if little pudgies aren't at three ETH and rods aren't at an ETH plus and big pudgies are not at 15 ETH plus, like there is no adding to the digital ecosystem. Like you just cannot do it. And if you do do it, then you just don't understand the business that you're in, which the business that I'm in is an accruing value to my holders. Like that's the business I'm in. If I'm not in that business, then I should have not been in Web3. I should have been doing some, I should have stick, stick, stuck, you know, selling gel blasters. I should have stayed doing that. And so yeah. that I think is the hard part is that just like the math, math, the mathematics of it all. But uh, it, it, it's nothing. I knew that coming into this and it's just a part of the game. So, so that makes total sense what you're saying. And I think a lot of people would, would agree with and, and support what you're saying as well. Um, putting aside the adding increased supply, right, across the, the, the kind of secondary collections, let's say, right? What's your perspective in general on, you know, there are many projects out there that have these very aggressive roadmaps that also have varying elements on the roadmaps, right? Some simpler, some more complex, right? And of course, we know that that's coming from the place that everyone wants to see action, right? And the way you get action is having you know, an incredible batch of promises, executing on them, which also presents risk. And, you know, we've all seen that together over the past several years. What's your perspective on on these roadmaps that are you know juicier and more more action packed versus tempering expectations and having something more in the direction of crypto punks? Let's say, like, where's your head at on that? Yeah, I think it depends, like, what your ethos is and like what you're building towards. I think it's always better to under promise and over deliver, and sometimes that can get hard in a very attention driven business, which this is very much that. Um. I think from my perspective, like, like as an entrepreneur and as a business builder, like you always want to dream as big as possible and, you know, aim for the, aim for the stars. And if you land on the moon, then the moon's good enough. Right. And so like, I definitely think there's that balance where you want to manage expectations because expectations lead to resentment. And if you set the wrong expectation, people will get resentful and then they'll sell. And, you know, the beauty about this space is it only takes a couple people to sell to really set you back. And, uh, yeah, but, but, but internally you have to dream big and you have to have a big roadmap and how you translate that to your community, I think is up to you, but you have to tread cautiously. But like, internally, what am I going for? I'm going for to be one of the biggest IP companies the world's ever seen. And I'll tell you that because I'm confident and that's what I'm going for. I'm not going to be, you know, one toy on the shelf. I'm going to be the toy on the shelf. I'm not going to be just some character in some show. I'm going to be the show, right? And that's just like the way that I'm programmed. And I encourage everybody listening to share the same mindset because that's a winning mindset. But in the same breath, you also have to be reasonable and you also have to understand that like, hey, like, this is what I'm going for. I'm going to try my hardest and work my ass off to get there. But, um, you know, how that happens, I think, and what that expectation is for when things come, I think people just need to understand that building a business is hard. And, you know, I, I think a lot of the user base today needs to define what they are and why they're here. I think a lot of people don't know if they're an investor or a trader. And depending on who you are, I think will set, you know, the expectation what projects you want to be a part of. If you're an investor, I think Pudgy Penguin's a great project for you. For you. I think if you're a trader too, sure. I mean, but you know, you can go trade anything. You can go trade shit coins and trading is great. So like, you know, I I'm personally optimizing for the investor because I think that's just a better culture. Like I've learned in the space like the the traders are like the the second the price goes down 20%, they're like dude, I'm going to find your mom and your brother and your dogs. And like, if I see them, it's over. And I'm like, all right, like, that's great. But so, so I think it's just who are you optimizing for and you know, what, what's the culture that you want to lead. And, and based on that, I think you set the expectation accordingly. That makes sense. That makes sense. So we're at May 10th now, I believe if I'm not mistaken, May 18th, you've got some news possibly coming out and you know, of course, uh, you can share whatever you feel comfortable not uh, feel comfortable sharing, not feel comfortable sharing on the show. Totally all okay. As part of the the recent uh, messaging and, and announcements I've seen, I've seen particular attention around on ramps specifically, right? And it kind of seems like 
message or two regarding plushies and kind of IRL product. And I mean, there's some kind of connection there. So, you know, whether it's specific to you guys and kind of the next steps and where you're going or, you know, your general thought process about on ramps and interacting with IRL, I'd love to hear, you know, your thoughts there as it connects the pudgies, as it doesn't connect the pudgies, anything you feel comfortable sharing, sharing there. Yeah, I, I think for us, like a huge part of what we want to do and what we want to accomplish is really abstract the blockchain layer. Like, how do you make this the back end and not the front end? And how can you start, like, how can you really leverage this technology for an existing industry? I think for us, the, the first step in kind of what we're shipping is like what I believe to be our mass market Pokemon card to our first edition, right? My first edition Pokemon card is my 8,888 Pudgy Penguins, right? You can license them, you can monetize them, you know, we will license them directly from you, right? So we'll make it easy and you don't even need to go and bank on you doing that yourself. You know, you can trade it frictionlessly. There's no inauthenticity issues. It quite literally is a Pokemon card, a first edition Pokemon card on steroids with like a bunch of like amazing other features. But to be Pokemon, which is ultimately the goal, like you need the mat, you need the, the rest of the additions. But how do you do that without being dilutive? How do you do that with being additive? Because I can't just go ship a million NFTs that can be traded and just have people go run rampant with that. And so there was an interesting, we came to an interesting solution. Part of that is leveraging soulbound technology and like, you know, and, and you know, what does it feel like to unlock things when you purchase a physical good and how does that translate to digital value? I don't want to go too much into it, but I think, you know, in the coming weeks, you guys will see kind of what our vision here is and, and how we plan on making this really clear. Um, but that's kind of, that's kind of where we are. I think, I think a huge part of everything that we do from a tech side and from a product side is really like, how do you innovate on existing products and models today? And how do you innovate using NFT tech to kind of do it? Which like, it's a very powerful technology to, you know, digitally own something. It's, it's not to be underestimated. And so I think this is kind of like the way that we're looking at, like, I don't want you to know that things are on the blockchain like I, I, there's no purpose. I don't need you to know that right now. Now in a Super Bowl, I'll have all of the leverage, all of the users, and all of the data to then push that narrative. But in the peak of a bear market, now is not the time to push that narrative. Now is the time to accumulate users and to accumulate your top of the funnel, so that when that Super Bowl comes and every celebrity is talking about it. Pudgy Penguins is the most familiar IP to the regular person. And they're like, oh, whoa, wait, this is what this is. This does this, this does that. And then I think you tell a really beautiful story. And, and that's really kind of our focus on a, on a tech product side. It's just like, how do you tie this vision of licensing and ownership and unlockables? And like, how do you do it with NFTs versus how it's done today, which is like, really done in an archaic fashion, if you know. Yeah, and that makes, that makes total sense. And I mean, as you think about not just the people within here, but certainly normies, right? They're not going to care one ounce that it's part of the blockchain. That's like a how question. It's not even like what the product is. Um, so I, I know that we're all close to it from history, but that's, I, I agree with you. I don't feel like that's how people are going to experience things, certainly moving forward. Um, let's use that as, as a segue, because I'm very curious, and I'm sure others are as well, your perspective on the current state of Web3 and your reaction to certain things. So we're going to have a little bit of fun here if you're open to it. And do like a little bit, it doesn't have to be Rorschach-like with one word, but a little bit of like a word association-ish kind of a game, if that's cool, um, where we hit on some concepts and get your reaction to them. Um, again, it doesn't have to be one word, just what your thought is in terms of how this fits into where we are now, where we need to go, all those kinds of things. So um, ready for that? Yeah. Let's do it. Um, so on ramps and security. The question is, is how does, you know, what are your thoughts on that? How crucial is that? Where do we need to go with that? You know, what's your, what's your thoughts and philosophy on that? I mean, it's everything, you know, it's like probably one of the most important infrastructure pieces that's needed for millions of people to participate. If people start losing all their money from scams, it's, uh, 
probably one of the biggest deterrents in the space today is the fishing guys are clever and the best of the best get fished and that's a problem and on ramps for obvious reasons it's too complicated to fund an nft wallet today it's just too difficult does that eventually lend itself to custodial or semi-custodial wallets where there's some kind of intermediary as much as most web3 people hate that is that where we eventually land for most things how do you see that playing I think it is. I think, you know, it's something that we've done at Pudgy. You know, one product that we're going to ship pretty soon is done via custody wallet solution. You sign up via an email and a password and we make you a wallet. <laughs> to expect the user to do anything different, I get. I guess it's like not, you know, Web3 Maxi oriented, but like, dude, you think anybody's going to go do anything differently? Like, why would I go... <laughs> Like if the world has been built around email and password, why are we going to go and try to re-educate them and build it around seed phrases? It's just like not feasible and reasonable. I think at least in the conversion, right? Like you can't just go from email and password to and, and blockchain and wallet to seed phrase. I don't think that happens, but I think it it can slowly be massaged. But yeah, I think custody wallets are probably going to be the inevitable next step in terms of onboarding users. Even though I know it gets like a, a viscerally harsh reaction, I'm sure there's a happy trade-off that exists there for many of us if it means more on-ramp and, and more users coming into the space. So it's definitely, it's a, definitely not a, a total loss if, if that's the direction. Uh, what about cross-chain assets, Luca? What's your, what are your thoughts about cross-chain assets? Is that, let me maybe ask it a little bit differently. Is that a thing and a necessary thing? Will that abs- be, become abstracted at some point and it's kind of semantics because it's back-end? Like, what are your thoughts there? inevitable 100 percent going to be the narrative five years from now okay um and will will people you know that that have nfts that are that are part of the will they know that it's that it's cross-chain it's going cross-chain is that just going to be no they won't even know they won't even know um royalties and that's obviously been a, a hot topic as of late we've talked about it you know, uh, within within MVHQ, we've talked about it on Numbers Therapy a couple of times. What are your thoughts on royalties in terms of where we're at currently, how crucial they are in terms of the, the foundational thought process of Web3? It shouldn't be the 5 and 7 and 10 percent. Like some of the I mean, I actually like did some math and I was like, dude, some of these guys made absolute generational wealth. <laughs> It shouldn't be that. I, I don't think it's 0.5 percent. I think there's a happy medium between like one and two percent. I, I would like to see that, right, as like a common consensus. You know, I, I don't think it's 0.5%. I think 0.5% at some point. It's like on OpenSea, I was so pissed when I saw this. On OpenSea, it's 2.5% to OpenSea and 0.5% to the creator. You got to be shit me, dude. That's, like, right that's, like, that's like insanity to me. That, like, when you when you look at it like that, like, I get it. Okay, like, make your fee, but, like, the fee should not be any lesser than the marketplace fee. Like, I think we all could agree with that. Traders alike. Like, I think, I don't think anyone could disagree with that. Like, why is OpenSea's fee, why does OpenSea make five times more money than me? Makes no sense. For what? No way. Some good SEO and a pretty good platform? Like, no thanks. (laughs) Totally makes sense. I mean, I, I'd agree with you. I'd say if anything, it should be inverted probably, right? I mean, they're also full tech, right? The, versus projects require more more human capital and services. So yeah, totally agree with you there. You touched on Soulbound before, um, certainly as it relates to your projects, but in general, or your project, but in general, what, what what's your take on Soulbound tokens? They've only been lightly used to date, let's say, right? And it hasn't been a heavy, heavy narrative so far. Where, where do you think that's going? Inevitable, the future. Any specific use cases that come to mind that you think are going to crop up more? It's just everything. It's to me, it's like a credit score. You know, like it's it's the only way to like identify people. Uh, obviously, people can make new wallets, but it's a really great way to signal who's doing what and what what they've done in the community, what they haven't done, what they do well. It's like a report card. I love them. Yeah. Um. This next one is uh, going to be a little bit interesting and a little bit controversial uh, Controversial as of late. Metaverses? I believe in them. Where, where do you think we're at right now as it pertains I think to we're metaverses? A long, I think we're a long way. I, I, think, I think we're way longer than people think. I could see 10, 15 years from now it being a huge narrative. At the end of the day, 
you have to understand that real life for a lot of people is really hard. And I used to be that kid that played 12 hours a day video games because my life sucked so bad. And like, if I just, if I could just escape reality, then people want to escape reality. And, and, and if you're not that person, then you should be thankful and you should be blessed. And I can only tell you as being somebody who wanted to escape reality for 10 years, it's not something I wanted to do. Uh, I didn't want to be around. So eh, it's going to shift. There's, there's too many people like that. A majority of the world is in that position. And then the rest of the world will keep enjoying life as they want. But the metaverse is ultimately inevitable, in my opinion. What do you take away from the fact that Oh, this isn't the first pass at the metaverse. You know, of course, we had Second Life originally back, which was you know, a handful of years ago at this point. Now we have this kind of wave and there was probably some steps in between, too. So like, it's this theme that keeps coming up. Right. Um, but it just hasn't for a batch of years. It just hasn't taken off yet at this point. Right. So I'm, I'm, it's a really hard question. But like what eventually does get it there? Is it just a really, really, really slow? I think it's, the, it's the tech. It's the right like. The headset, I think, is a huge part of it. Like, to really escape right now, like, I put on a, a meta quest. Like, I'm throwing up after 30 minutes of exploring, you know, Mount Kilimanjaro. Like, it's like there's there's settings and there's, like, it's just not there. The, the user experience is not better than a Fortnite or any of the above. But, I mean, dude, if I can plop on a meta quest headset... And, you know, like even like courtside of the Lakers game, like you think about like what it can really do. I mean, there's so many industries that it's just like if they figure out the tech, why would I do? There's maybe 10 things that I could I could label like even just offices. Like I think this is really what Facebook was working. But like right now, remote work is really inefficient. Like you just can't tell me otherwise. Like I, it just is people are taking advantage of it left and right. But if I can go pop a metaverse headset on, work my ass off for 12 hours a day, not get nauseous, it works seamlessly. And then like we all can be in a room present together. Like there's just 10 different business businesses that I think this thing can completely disrupt from like live ticketing to like, you know, cons like it just like it in its final form is the future. It just like how long does it take? I don't know. Like I could easily see it taking 20 years. Like it, like I, I, the whole like metaverse craze when it was happening, like back in 2022, 2021, I was like, this is nonsense, dude. Like, this is like, we are so far from it, you know, but like there will be a day where it comes. And when it comes, it's going to be like nothing. I think humankind has ever, has ever seen before. Truthfully. Is it use case, different use cases with this? Like take your laser Lakers example, right? Is it different use cases with the same person in the future or is it two totally different segments? So said differently, is it, you know, the same person sometimes wants to go to the game, you know, with their headset and sometimes actually wants to go in person because they want to see people and smell and be around people. And, you know, I don't know, whatever sensory things that exist, or is this probably two totally separate people? One who just prefers to be at home more and likes that experience, especially if it's a little bit less expensive and one who just wants to go IRL, like, or, or is it both? What do you think? I think it's both. I think it's like one, there's, there's the misanthrope and the introvert that is just like, no, I'm, this is how I'm living my life. Like, you know, the, 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 you know, there, and there's a lot of people like this. And then there's also like maybe the person like me who's like, okay, I'm an introvert, but like, I'm not, I would love to go to courtside to a basketball game, but I worked a long time. So I'm just going to put on the meta quest and go watch the game. I think that's like a lot of the revenue right now from the MetaQuest or people like that. I think a lot of the serious Metaverse candidates, it's just too expensive and too much friction today. But as costs get come down and product improves, I think like to think that 20 years from now there isn't a headset in everybody's house, I think is to underestimate the Metaverse. That makes, that makes total sense. So one more and then we'll go to maybe one last question afterwards. But Amazon. Um, thoughts on the impending Amazon marketplace. You can even extend it to Coinbase if you really want to, since there was a little bit of precedent there, but obviously a way different picture in terms of scale. Um, Amazon, what, what are your thoughts? How is that going to fit into everything? Bullish. I, um, I, I'm a little familiar with their product, so I don't want to dive into it just for NDA reasons, but I'm bullish. Okay, fair enough. Um, we could, why don't we flip it over to Coinbase instead? We'll try that. Um, thoughts on Coinbase, for instance, when it came into into the you know into the world NFT world and where it exists now is is there a place? Is there a place? 
I mean, they just rolled it out wrong. I mean, what a botch of a rollout. It was, it was nothing but a marketing problem, and, I, and the product definitely sucked a little bit. But they had the right idea. They were trying to social network ties NFTs and NFT marketplaces, which is a really good thought and the right thought, in my opinion. Um, it just was poorly executed from a UX UI standpoint, from a marketing and rollout standpoint. It was just like complete botch. But I mean, I would, I, I think the right people in charge of the Coinbase NFT marketplace could absolutely crush it. Yeah, I was going to say, does it? I, I understand they were doing it. Of course, those things would naturally connect and, of course, would help them differentiate. But does that need to be all in one place? Like, can they just be a perfectly good, seamless marketplace? Is that now becoming too much of a commodity because it's too easy to become a marketplace? Like, I, I think you need to have a core differentiating factor. Like, you can't, you know, Blur came in with their core differentiating factor. OpenSea was kind of that net neutral in the middle. Like, if you want to win the marketplace business, you got to do something different. Yeah. That makes sense. That makes sense. So... You know, right now, you know, we're, we're heading into May. We, you know, we still have a bit of a shaky economy. We still have got some on-ramp things that are needed and a variety of other challenges that exist, security challenges, so on and so forth. But, you know, I think we're all quite confident that space is, is, is going to boom. It's just a matter of when. Where do you think we're, we're headed in the near term, in the midterm, as it relates to this space? Um, you know, do you think that uh, you know the, the the bigger players within the space are going to con continue to be successful, even if they've had some some gaffes along the way. And over time, you know that will majorly stand the test of time. Not just pudgies, of course, because you know your approach has been quite different, which is great. Um, but do you think the bigger players over the test of time, as, as we look in the longer time horizon, that's going to pan out? Do we think we're going to continue to see these kind of more more meme one off projects that are that are just kind of you know, quick, quick flyers and in, in out. Is that going to exist? Like, where do you think we're going here? Yeah, I think this, the NFT space right now is like the 2017 coin crash. If you look at the 2017 coins, I remember it vividly because I lost more money than I could imagine. But in 2017, coins that were in the top 10, you're like, no way, these are not going to be in the top 10. This is, you know, NEO, the China Ethereum, and like... Every narrative that you told you, you could tell the same thing for the top 10 in the NFT space, or maybe I think they're starting to weed themselves out, but don't think that something is too big to fail or they're too well capitalized or too well funded or this guy's resume he comes from this place. Like hey, you're in for a rude awakening. This is 2017 all over again. And, and then this is where also the winners are going to pull apart, just like they did from 2017 to 2020. Guys kept building, dudes were building their core base, and then when the bull market came back, they broke all-time highs and just smashed to, like, new, new heights. And that's what I think is going to happen. My only thing is, is the, 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 the undefeatables, the, the top of the totem poles, don't think that they can't come crashing down, I and mean, we've already seen it, right? The, the creme de la creme, the untouchables, is so we thought. And, and don't think that they can come back. They will wither away the same way that the others have, just like the coins did, right? Like ICX, I remember that one, and the NEO. Like, what happened to all those? Those were all top tens. IOTA, again, if you were around in 2017, you're like totally feeling what I'm saying right now. Like, what were these? All these things were humongous. They were top tens. They were the creme de la creme. You were waiting to buy that dip. And that dip is completely dipped into oblivion and is never coming back it's a variety of things in those cases is it balance sheet problems is it team problems is it you know is it there's no royalties that, you know which links to to balance like is, is it just a mix of things that you think dudes, are gonna be the think, dudes think this shit is fucking easy and i think all of the failure up until this point has been has been from the top down I, f failure always will be from the top down i believe like there's always a way to pivot there's always a way to innovate and there's always a way to save like there always is you can't tell me otherwise. And unless you run out of money, right? And like none of these guys who've fallen from the top of the totem pole have ran out of money. They have plenty of money. So like the problem isn't, the problem is like who is steering that ship, dude? Yeah. You just need to start steering the ship in the right direction. And it's like, I, I'm, I'm, I, and I go above and beyond to try to help some of these, some, some of these guys. I, I really do. Just need to steer the ship better, dude. Yeah, that. I mean, I think that's that's a great place to end. I think, to be honest, because I think we've seen this trend way too many times of ships being or ships being steered well, and 
It's not being steered well. So, I mean, this was just a, an absolute treat and a fantastic conversation, Luca. Really, really appreciate you coming on and coming through so openly. I'm sure many of us in here are excited to see what you have coming in the coming week, days, weeks, that sort of a thing. Um, definitely uh, already had many fans in here, but certainly picking up some more, no doubt about it. So really appreciate you coming on and talking through. Um, to everyone listening you know, live, very much appreciate you, like always, and, and the questions as our recorded listeners appreciate you as well so thank you so much again luca and we'll see everyone similar time next week thanks for having me bye